opening of the Hilton Garden Inn is tonight. Oh, wow. Okay. I went by and breezed. All right, let's call our meeting to order. Welcome to the Jacksonville Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee. This is our 40th meeting. At this time, I'd like to welcome our members, city staff, and then uh, Jason and David, who will be presenting for us tonight. 
At this time, do we have, hopefully everybody's had a chance to look at the agenda. Do we have um, a motion to adopt or correct, reject? I make a motion to adopt. Okay. Do we have a second? second. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Our agenda will be adopted as written. Then we've, um, Glenn emailed out earlier last week the minutes from our February 1st meeting. Hopefully everybody's had a moment to look over those. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you. <laughs> I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Webb. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that's everyone. All right, so our minutes from our February meeting will be adopted as written. And of always, as we were talking earlier, if your attendance report does not look correct, please let the city staff know and they will address as needed. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and David as they're going to take over. Thank you all for having us. Um, this is David Sinclair. He's, he works underneath me uh, in the Parks Department. He's our crew leader for the landscape side. I'm the horticulturalist. Uh, so what we're going to do, pretty much everything that you see, David is involved one way or the other. Uh, he's my eyes and ears on the job site. So um, I take you know, pride in what, what the project looks like as a whole, but I couldn't do it without David's help and support in uh, making that happen with the, with the workers that we have. So uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll get started. Basically what we're going to do is go through uh, pretty much projects that we've done throughout the year, uh, kind of like what, what we did last year. And if you have any questions, just, just uh, ask towards the end and uh, I'll try to answer them the best I can. So our first picture here, this is at Riverwalk Crossing Park. Uh, we did a summer installation uh, of annuals right in here with the African violets and the coleus uh, down to the side. And this is at the other end of, the, of that uh, as well. This is uh, violas that David, you see him there. Uh, we actually had volunteers from the military base come in and actually help us install some over at Richard Ray Park uh, this past winter. This is the winter annuals over at, at Riverwalk as well. And this is obviously uh, down by the flagpoles here by City Hall. This is actually the summer bed that we were working on. And of course, David makes the picture on this one as well. Uh, <laughs> but we, we've actually roughly did uh, 5,800 summer annuals and winter annuals this year. Uh, that number has completely creeped up on us. I think uh, I've ordered for the summertime this coming year um, right around 3,600, uh, now give or take some of those we may lose, we may, you know, uh, their replacements, but, uh, we are always adding areas uh, <coughs> as we go through, you'll see on court street, we've definitely added some areas there this past year. Uh, one of the things that we did, we did add was flower pots. We've got some over at city hall here. Uh, we've done some on new bridge street and, uh, we've actually been able to put some at public safety, uh, and actually public service building as well. So here is Riverwalk Park. This is a continuation. We did this job in phases. Uh, we're still in the pro process of working on this. Uh, basically what we had was some, some dying turf. Uh, the weeds have kind of taken over in some areas. Uh, this was a very, very sandy area. And what we did is we, we decided to put in a different grass uh, that could handle the foot traffic that we have because it's such a used park. Uh, we're trying to work around with the, with the oak trees right now. We're working with the extension agent right now, trying to figure out what we need to do underneath these trees uh, from a long-term fix. You know, one of the possibilities that we've looked at is maybe even putting um, shrubs uh, instead of turf long-term uh, to try to fix some of this area. Uh, but right now, obviously, we, we did lay sod back in this area because we didn't want to leave it. We wanted it to, to stay the same and stay uniform. And plus, we're, we're working down on each phase of the park into L.P. Willingham eventually this coming year. But this is the process. We had to side cut everything. Um, basically, we take that small two-foot pass, and we cut everything that's in that square. And we take it up. We found some irrigation breaks while we were in there, which was a good thing, so we could fix it while we, you know, we had it disturbed already. Uh, David, you know, his expertise is in some of the irrigation work here. Uh, he was able to fix most of this all internally. And this is what we had right before we put sod down. <clears throat> this is what it looked like as we were laying it. And you can go out there today. Obviously, we're starting to see green up, but um, it's definitely a, a much better grass as far as wear tolerance uh, from that standpoint. Another David. 
<laughs> Another day of the day. That's right. Uh, we we installed 35 pallets in, in that pod, um, and it took approximately three weeks from start to finish for us to complete it. And uh, as I said, we're moving down to the next pod in Riverwalk, which will be the last one, and then we'll actually move into LP Willingham the same time frame. So that is coming up. This is Wooten Park. We were having some erosion problems. Uh, this is the newer style bathroom that the city is using now. Uh, you see one over at the landing. Yeah. Uh, we've got one here. And we had some concerns with some of the erosion uh, right around the building. Uh, it didn't have gutters. So that was the first thing that we tried to fix. So that we had FMS come in and put some gutters in. But we also wanted to fix some of the areas, not just right at the building, but we had some areas that were, if you look down at the bottom, we had erosion underneath the uh, pine tree that's there. Mm. So what we did is come back in, side cut everything out, brought in newer and better soil, and then we started uh, laying out plant material uh, for, for this job, which was a pretty quick job. And this is what it looked like uh, when we got finished. <clears throat> we installed 70 plants, um, 25 bales of pine straw, and it only took us about a week from start to finish to, to do that job. This is New Bridge Street. It's basically right across the street by the, the, the lawyer's office. Uh, they had a bunch of Ili Agnes that, that always give us a problem with uh, one Ili Agnes grows extremely fast. And so what we did is come in and, and took them out um, to put something else in that, that basically blended in with the street for right now. Uh, and, and this is what we ended up doing. We used the crepe myrtles, the abelias, and the nandinas. And, and it took us two days, I think, to do, it every, to do all of it. Um, this is New Bridge Street. I think we were actually about to work on this job when we did the last presentation. Uh, this was a DOT-funded project. Uh, this was the extension of the city parking lot. We went on the other side of the payroll building, and we did some jut outs in the parking lot and added a couple parking spaces over there. Uh, this is what it looked like before we really got involved in the, into this project. Uh, we had a lot of rock, a lot of debris, which is typical of a construction site for us, and we were able to turn it into that, uh, which is a whole lot better uh, look for from a city standpoint. Obviously, we use brick chips because it ties in and it's uniform for what we do, but it's a long-term fix for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, there were two trees we installed, 50 shrubs, 25 perennials, 30 tons of red brick chips, and it took us about two weeks from start to finish once we started, started cleaning up behind construction, which was a pretty quick project for us. This is over in front of the Mont Montford Point uh, Memorial area. Uh, the streets department actually came in and filled in a ditch. They put piping in, uh, filled in a ditch. This area was an area we knew that there was going to be more added to the Montford Point Memorial. Uh, and it was an area where it was very hard to maintain, uh, not just from our standpoint, but from the basis standpoint as well. And we wanted to make it more appealing where people could see it. So what we did is we went in after streets and basically leveled it back out and installed rolls of sod uh, throughout that whole area. So it's a whole, a whole lot easier. It looks a lot better. Uh, and I think they're actually working on construction now for their next phase. So uh, that, should be, that should look nice this coming year. By July 25th, when they have their event there. Yep. And we can tell you, we've taken the, the heavy truck out there, and it's, it's held up. <laughs> and we actually put 141 rolls of sod out there, which it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot. And, and it took us about two weeks, and we did it in the middle of summer, which is not typically when you want to lay sod, but uh, we, we had to go. You know, it was time for us. We were behind other people, and we had to get it done. Get it done. This is Public Safety Memorial. Uh, this is actually the beginning phases of this. This was actually my first drawing of what this was going to be. Um, it took us approximately about a year to actually get something finalized and moving in the right direction. You can see this is the beginning of actually what it looked like before we started. Uh, we had, I had painted every area so everyone understood what we were doing and, and what it was supposed to look like. And this was the very first day we worked was actually to put an irrigation line in and it's actually just a water line and as you see these these slides are going to be as a continuation of the project um, hopefully 
I will say within the next two to three weeks, we will be finished. That is the goal. Um, this project has taken us approximately three months to do, uh, but that's on and off with, with rain and materials. So this is a process-driven project uh, because of so much material that we had for it. That's what it looks like today, okay? Um, and what we don't have or what you can't see in this picture is we will have paver, pavers around the outside of it. Uh, that's a six-foot wide waterfall, and there's actually three bubblers. If you can look in the middle of the, the picture there, uh, that's going to be shooting up. And this is for the public safety memorial. This is not just police, but it's also fire as well. Uh, they'll be having their uh, event, I think. May 11th. May 11th. So the idea is we're going to be finished before it, and that's where it's going to be taking place at this coming year. Like I said, it was three months' worth of work. Uh, David led most of the, the, the wall stone work. Um, that's a hard job. I mean, the, these stones are 40 to 50 pounds a piece. Uh, so it's not something that you can just go in and, and just throw it together. You have to you know, level it out, measure it, and everything else. This is Court Street. This is what it looked like before. This was the typical Court Street with junipers down at the bottom. You had Bradford pears that were, that were in the middle of the trees. And what we wanted to do is bring it alive a little bit. Uh, we did one on the very end last year uh, with some summer annuals right up against Old Bridge Street. We got a lot of compliments on what it looked like, so we wanted to carry that same um, look and uniform down some. So what we did is we did most all of this work internally. That's David actually in the truck uh, <laughs> cutting, cutting the trees. We actually had to cut the trees first. Uh, we cut all the limbs off because we had power above, and then we took the trees out, and we actually had to get streets involved to help with the backhoe work because these things were so <coughs> matted with roots. Uh, you can see it's probably two foot deep in some of those of the root matting that was in there. So we needed to start fresh. Um, I'm sure they're 15, 20, 25, 30 years old, uh, and I don't doubt it way, the way the root matting was. And this is what it looks like. This is what it looked like before we did flowers, and then this is what they look like today. Um, the, the plan is we'll put um, permanent plant material in, a few of them, and then we'll still have the annual color around them um, from a long-term fix. We removed five trees, 12 junipers, and all the root matting. Uh, we installed six yards of compost and uh, 300 annuals and 12 shrubs. And it took us about a week to do it. Um, and street, streets did do uh, some help with the traffic control and stuff like that for us to be able to do it in a busy section of, of downtown. This is part of cleaning green. This is... Um, this is right in front of Walmart on uh, 17, yes. and this is what it looked like before, and that's obviously what it looked like afterwards, right. and this is another part of what we do from our department um, about edging and stuff like that. Uh, if you're on Hargett Street or you, you're in those areas, you see us every once in a while come through. Uh, we are may pushing to do more frequent edging this year. I know we've already done more this year than we did last year for the most part. Um, and we're going to try to, to do more uh, from a trash perspective as well. Right here it says we've picked up 80 pounds of trash each day. Uh, we went from uh, 60, I think, last year to 80 as an average. And that's over 20,000 pounds of trash just for, for basically two guys, and they're working eight hours a day. Uh, so it's a lot. Our landscape maintenance, which I'm going to focus more towards David and, and his people uh, with this slide, is right now currently with everything that we've added, we're over 15 acres of landscape beds. Um, that's over 650,000 square, square feet of, of, of bed area, uh, which equivalates to about 14 tractor trailer loads of mulch a year, and it contributes to about eight loads of brick chips a year. Okay. Uh, which is a massive amount from what we were just two or three years ago, you know. Our mowing responsibilities, uh, <coughs> we do obviously mow in our department. We mow 135 acres of North Carolina DOT roadways. We mow 260 acres in our parks. We, know, we mow about 90 acres of facility buildings at, at a total of 485 acres, basically a week during the growing season that we're taking care of. This slide I put in here because we were 
fortunate enough to be able to be involved with the parade this year. It's the first time our department had been involved in it, and we took we took um, we took it serious. We did. We, we did. Um, it was very very interesting. I didn't know how how the guys would be. You know, first of all, I said, yeah, of course we would do something like this. And then I, I let the guys get involved and, and come up with some ideas on what we wanted to do. And finally, the, basically the day before, we finalized everything, and uh, we were able to put some plant material on it. Uh, obviously, we're promo promoting clean and green, uh, but we actually put a mower on there, which was a propane mower. I had Santa Claus with our vest that we work on the roadways with, and then we had trash cans and pickers and, and everything else. So it turned out pretty cool. And, we had, I think, 20 or 25, well, there was 20 of our employees that were there out of the 25 that we had wow. for that Saturday event and helped us walk. Wow. Uh, so we definitely had a, a, a big impact, and we, we enjoyed it. We talked about it even months after, after <laughs> that. You know, we, we, caught, we got caught on TV dancing. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it, but we were out in the middle with Dr. Woodruff dancing, and it was, it was, it was really a good time. And the dueling mowers were very popular. Yes, we yeah. had two mowers beside us that were, that were going as well, doing circles around the truck at the whole time. Christmas decorations. Uh, obviously, you see where we have the presents around the Christmas tree uh, this past year and like the last week that we had the tree up the year before. Uh, but what we did do is we added um, more lights to the live oak trees that are down there along Riverwalk Park and L.P. Willingham. Uh, this was a first for me. Uh, it was an idea I had, but I didn't know how well it was going to look at night. And obviously, I thought, you know, it's a dark area. This would be an, an area that, that would look, look good. I've got good plans for this coming year, I will tell you that. <laughs> So on our light tour next year, do we need to Oh, we, we definitely <laughs> may want to go down there. Um, you know, it's, uh, this takes... I would say two months to actually design and actually implement it uh, when it's all said and done. But I think the impact that it, that's there, uh, especially when you have Winterfest, which is a big event for, mm -hmm. for the recreation department, right. um, it, it falls right in place with what we're trying to do here. Um, so we did 10,000 lights on those live oaks. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is when you're having a wrap <laughs> yes. and, and trying to make sure you have power for all of those. Uh, we did the, the lighted presents, and we did some additional, um, actually, pole decorations in the commons area around the pond this past July 4th. We took some of our Christmas decorations and changed the bulbs in them, and we were able to do some red, white, and blue stars, which was pretty nice, and we got some comments on Facebook with that. The Beirut Memorial Grove, which is near and dear to me and David for, for all that, that counts, and, and we, you know, we try to do our best in trying to maintain this to the level that it should be. And it's a big project when we installed it, but we knew the long-term perspective of that was the maintenance years to come. The trees are healthy. The trees, even with the way the temperatures have been up and down, uh, they're budding out. I have no problems in saying that those trees are doing wonderful. Um, we had two trees we had to replace this past year, and we had one rose bush out of all the trees that we had. We had 272 or three trees and 650 roses, and that's all we've lost within the last two years, to be honest with you. Um, the things that we have been doing um, from a maintenance perspective, we did put some mulch around the tree rings. Uh, we've put two sulfur applications out for the turf, and we've mowed it 14 times this past year. We've done some tree and shrub fertilizer and one pre-emergent, which would mainly be where the roses are uh, from, from there. And it looks good. Um, and I, actually, I think we're getting ready to mow it tomorrow, to be honest with you. So this year, from, from David's side, uh, we've installed over 120 trees and 300 shrubs, decorative stone, pavers, and block, over 5,800 seasonal annuals. 150 tons of red brick chips, 350 bales of pine straw, 1,050 cubic yards of mulch, 150 pallets of sod. At an estimated material cost standpoint, almost $300,000 for, for what that is. Uh, and that's all internal. That's not hiring. That's not doing any of that. So our upcoming projects, which I did mention some of those already, which will be the Riverwalk pod, that last pod, and then the LP uh, Willingham Park sod installation. Uh, Huff Drive and Highway 17 stone installation. Uh, basically what you see today, we've, we just went and done mulch on uh, Huff Drive and we did mulch this past year on Highway 17, which are the little islands out in the middle of Highway 17. 
it's a safety concern with the Highway 17 when we really, we struggled with some of that this past year. And that's one reason why you probably haven't seen us do it yet this year. Uh, we need to find a permanent solution in trying to do that. So one of the things that we have looked at is going to a, it's not a brick chip, but it's, on, it's a river stone. Um, it's a little bit larger than what you may be used to around here. Uh, but this will make it to where it's basically a one-time deal. We're out there one time, we get it done, and we're out of the way. And it's mainly to maintain it long term from that standpoint. So I'm really happy that that council and, and Dr. Woodruff has really helped us kind of move in that direction. And what you'll see is a, basically a four or five year plan. And you'll see it in Huff Drive, you'll see it uh, on the parkway, you're going to see it uh, in the interchange area on Highway 17, those larger areas. And anything going forward, hopefully from a DOT standpoint, we will flow that direction on the short term, on the install part to begin with. Um, but the amphitheater, we were actually just out there today. Uh, we, we laid some sod this week, uh, but it's, it's getting close. It is very, very close to being operational. Uh, I think the power is, is up on the lights, and the sod actually will be completely across the whole hill. Uh, there's going to be some landscape beds in front of the stage area, uh, and then there's some there's an island in there that's going to have some landscaping as well. That project is within, I would say, from my standpoint, two months from being completely finished. Yeah. It's going to take us about a month to do what we need to do over there. But uh, if you were to see it today and then see it, you know, two months from now, you would understand why it would take so long to, to do something like that. But it looks great. It's phenomenal. Uh, we've been working on that for probably a year and a half. Uh, just our department has been working on that for a year and a half of trying to get it to where we can open it up. Uh, the park and ride enhancements over in the Commons, we will add to what is, is the, the contractor does. Uh, I'll oversee most of that project from a landscape's perspective. And I am working with a designer right now for some areas uh, where Piney Green and 17 meet. Uh, we're looking at that gateway area right now. Uh, I have plans for there, uh, but there's some areas we want to add to that. Uh, so we're planning with some DOT funding to be able to, to push forward with that as well. Uh, I have approved plans for Johnson Boulevard. There's three little islands out here that kind of ties in uh, where the cemetery, the cemetery area is to City Hall. There's some green grass islands out there that I have plans for as well. Uh, that you'll see within the next year, I, I would suspect. And then, of course, the cemetery. We have the new sign there, but we do want to put landscaping in there, and we're actually looking at doing a memorial actually inside the uh, cemetery. So that'll have a different look, too, as well. And then, of course, Sturgeon City, uh, the, the new center they're building down there. I've already been back and forth with working with um, Deanna and uh, making sure that, you know, the, it's a tricky area because there's a lot of natural areas there. Uh, so we have to meet some certain specs from a plant material standpoint. Uh, so I'm definitely going to be involved in making sure that that is copacetic. So that's part of what we're doing and uh, part of my job and what David's been working on and kind of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, does anybody have any questions? No, I just can't thank you all enough for your hard work because it's yeah. very noticeable. Well, and and, and y'all have done a great job. You know, I, David is good. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> David is good, but he has two hands. He, we can't do this without everybody's buy-in right. from our department and city council, you know, buy-in or, you know, our, Michael for, for all that matters and making sure that we, we have the things that we need to make sure that we can do what we're supposed to do. And I'm very appreciative that y'all are willing to take the time out to care, you know, and promote that from, from that perspective because I don't think it's said enough. And I just, I want to say thank you, you know, from that perspective, because it makes me feel good um, because I can show this to all the workers at our department, um, but the feedback that we get, um, and it's not necessarily just in here, but the feedback we get in general, mm -hmm. people stopping us on the side of the road and appreciate what right. we're doing and how we're doing it. We do take that, you know, we don't take that lightly. We, we are thrilled to do that. So anybody else have anything? It really makes Jackson feel. I know. Yeah. I mean, we get so many compliments. Just the, the, the beauty that it presents, and the trees. What type of plants you said you put under the trees that will survive? 
But we, every shrub will survive under shade. Well, ground covers are, are a better choice. Um, we use cotton ester uh, is, a, is a type of shrub that we would use that is actually a ground cover, uh, Asiatic jasmine. And we actually have put in underneath crepe myrtles. We had the picture uh, there at Riverwalk Park. We put annuals in. And basically what we did is we went above the tree roots and basically built a bed. Um, the reason why we could do that is the trees are mature now. So the, the, uh, the tree roots are way further away from the tree than, it, than right on top of it so it can survive. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. The tree roots are really at the drip line of the tree. So the outer most furthest limbs, that's where your active roots are taking up nutrients. So you can do a little bit of work around those trees closer to it as long as, you know, you don't get into the roots and that type of thing. So that's why we build on top of the roots. Thank you. You've impressed okay. them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great job. Thank you both for your service. Thank you. We do appreciate it. Okay. At this time, we're going to go over the subcommittee matters. Um, and and Linda's not here for the planning subcommittee. Do you want to... Um, I'm going to let um, um, Lily um, bring any things to point, but the, uh, the activity that you'll see is in your um, document on page 9. So, um, um, Lily, would you like to highlight anything from um, there that you, that you found that... Um, just um, would like to highlight we had a successful cleanup this week with our Youth Council in partnership with the Environmental Appearance Committee and Community Development. They adopted two homes in Belfort Homes to help some... Uh, Two seniors with the yard work did a great job. And then we um, talked about it, and Miss Grace and Miss um, Willie were there about continuing to promote the Adopt the Street, Dot the Park, Dot the Trail programs. One of the ideas that came out of that meeting was to um, ask each uh, board member to identify a group, church, sorority, whatever you may be affiliated with, um, a civic group, and encourage them to adopt the street that you would help us get at least one each if each member gets one street adopted that would be a great goal for this um this year how many more do we know how many more streets we have left we, there's a ton there's of a streets. ton of streets yeah. plenty of just, streets yeah yeah there's, we're not going to run out of streets <laughs> yeah we're not we have plenty of streets <laughs> and um so that was it there was some discussion real briefly about what's going on in Myrtlewood. we are working as a staff um, on addressing that, we will also be adopting a new neighborhood, Overbrook, under our Office of Livable Neighborhoods. Um, and that was pretty much um, it. Very short, succinct meeting. Okay. Right. And I'll just mention on recognition that we're still um, obviously taking um, nominations for that. This is the time to start looking for those homes as it is. I think not having the pressure of picking something every month lets us be more selective and that you can. But remember when you're out driving and you guys too, when you see some home that's um, out there or a business that's um, worthy, that their appearance is significantly improved, um, you know, you can nominate it on our website. You can let us know. You can call the front desk. We'll take information, try to get it. We really try to get people to go through the website because they can submit a picture and do things like that. And uh, that helps us a great deal there as it is too. So um, anyone can nominate online whenever you want to. All right. Thank you. All right. The next one is tree board. So Arbor Day um, is going to be held on April 27th at 9 a.m. at Carolina Forest Elementary. And this will be the 39th Tree City USA Award for the city of Jacksonville. Um, so it is open to the public for all those I guess he want to come. The more the merrier. We would love to have some folks. But, um, and again, Jason and his crowd are the ones who have got the trees picked out and will assist um, with the students, I'm sure, who will help somewhat of the planning like they've done in the past. So um, we would like to thank Carolina Forest for being our host site, and we're looking forward to a, a good turnout. Let's mention also, if you don't mind, Suzanne, not only did we get a Tree City Award this year, we got the Growth Award, and that was largely from the oh, work yeah, that we did. Jason and his folks did, and these Tree City moments that we've been having and some other things that have been doing, this public education um, is part of that. And, of course, um, from the Tree City Board, the Tree Board, um, we you can't go back in the same category. You've kind of got to pick out of that, remember, that menu of list, mm -hmm. you know, to get things done as it was there. And we're going to call on him for a Tree City moment, but we want to, 
is part of what we want to do is remind people they can donate funds for trees. This is the time to do this, and we're pretty much at the cutoff to be under this year's recognition. But um, $50 is your suggested minimum, $100 a fund, fully fund a tree, and $200, um, Jason will be very happy to pick out a specimen tree and um, help you get it at a specific location and do something from there. And here are some of the specimen trees that have been featured. We know the Keys did this at a special location, and um, these were selected by the crowd over here so they make sure that they, they fit what they have in there. And I, I like that you have a couple of understory trees in there, too, so that's, a, that's always a good thing. But at Sturgeon City Park, it's really looking nice down there and at maturing up in a great way. The Richard Way Park, obviously, it looks quite different than this picture, um, and it's going to look probably even more different this year as it is there. And we'll hopefully have that um, signage issue finished here shortly. And then the ball fields, which you can put trees there. We are moving the tree registry to online. We are getting a new website, and so we're waiting with that. There comes some benefits that we're going to be able to do that. And obviously the seasonal plantings that you just heard them talk about, you can sponsor one of those and put the Willie Saunders, you know, um, memorial um, or, excuse me, in honor of Willie Saunders out there. You know, that's what you can that have here. Live on. <laughs> you'll, you'll have the honor there for that type of thing as it was there. $2,500 to do the entire park or $500 just to do a pod. And um, you can do the Freedom Fountain out there. As you know, that is a showcase out there. That <laughs> really looks that. nice. That's and you remember, many of you know, if you watch the 6 o'clock news or the noon news or stuff there, we stream that 24-7 out there, and it gets picked up by the television stations, and they use it as backdrop for their, uh, for their weather shots. And so you can be looking and say, I did that, you know, and help that as it was there. And obviously at the Freedom Fountain, those beds that are out there, they are a true pop of color out there. Mm -hmm. And these targets for wayward cars and um, such there, these, <laughs> these are also available out there and they keep them going as it was. And of course the little park here at City Hall, um, our respite out there is also available to you too. The gateway signs um, beds are there and um, you can get that done if you'd like to do that. And um, the recreation centers and the compound down at Sturgeon City and uh, the senior center and the trade train depot are there. We have this booklet is online. It's been updated now to reflect the new uh, public safety memorial too. And so um, that's that's out there as it is. So without further ado, if you don't mind, we'll pass this over to him for a Tree City moment. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so with the, the Tree Growth Award, we're, we're doing some educational classes and, or some information uh, to pass along to viewers and to uh, anyone who wants to, to look at it. Uh, but basically what I want to do is kind of come back to why, why I do what I do, why David does what he does. Uh, and it comes back to what are the benefits? I know we, we talked about pollen earlier, and I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> but you're going to understand why here in just a second. The benefits of trees, you know, it's air quality, water quality, spirituality and psychology, social and community stewardship, economy and energy. Air quality, trees absorb air pollution from the atmosphere, sulfur dioxide, nitro nitrogen oxide, soot, dust, pollen emissions from diesel engines. They reduce the air pollutants that are detrimental to our human health, such as asthma. Lowers air temperatures. Obviously, we have shade. Reduces global warming and stores carbon dioxide for our atmosphere. The water qualities. Trees purify uh, water through leaves and roots naturally, filtering water and removing pollutants. Stores water from the ground and recharges the water table. It promotes... Uh, clean waterways through absorbing sediments, nutrients, and chemicals before they enter streams. They fight floods with reduced soil erosion. It slows the movement of stormwater uh, in some aspects. From a spirituality and psychology, uh, visual beauty and sensual en enhancements of trees elevates people's moods and improves their mental and physical health. Patients at hospitals uh, where they have rooms facing trees and landscape experience an accelerated recuperation time and consume smaller amounts of painkillers. And if you look at just our hospital here, look at what they have done around the landscape there 
uh, in promoting that uh, where you go into I know several of the hospitals around here uh, they have little uh, alleyways or that type of thing where they have landscaped areas in there so when patients walk by they get that they have the option of going out there and kind of enjoying it and you've seen that now even not in not just there but in nursing homes as well uh, social and community stewardship, a quality of life, greener the surroundings draws residents to interact with nature. Uh, for adults, it's to socialize, and for children, it's to play outside. Urban forests are associated with residents feeling safer. Uh, parks, you can use those for an example. Uh, you feel safer when you're in a park. Urban uh, residents living in greener areas build strong feelings of belongings and attachment to their neighborhood, i.e., people sitting in here and the trees that compromise their neighborhoods. You know, you care about that tree. You, you notice those trees. And from an economy standpoint, trees have shown to boost property values from 35 to 10%, uh, which is a big lump sum when you're looking at a total price of a house. Shoppers are willing to spend 9 to 12% more at stores located along tree line streets. Hence, New Bridge Street, we've, we have trees down there now. And trees save money during summer months by reducing temperatures and the need for air conditioner on buildings, um, not just in the business standpoint, but from our home standpoint as well. Questions? <coughs> so you're going to see some more of these. Yes. <laughs> but I think they're, they're nice fodder for this yeah. matter. If you'd like me to continue, yep, Madam Chair, right I'll, I'll quickly go through some one city moments. Um, you remember um, this campaign. Um, Lily is the is she she's the the, the torch bearer for one city, um, and um, so you know Lily chime in at any moment here as you go ahead there. But the ones that we kind of chose um, for your um, for your enlightenment tonight is we thought were in, that typify us as a community. The Save a Life event it was held on National Stop the Bleed Month um, Day. Um, this past um, Saturday, yes, it was Easter Saturday, the Saturday before Easter, but, you know, people showed up out there at the Commons. Um, it was a nice um, event. Um, lots of the stuff from the hospital were there, and obviously the city had quite a, a presence out there as it was. But the, one of the things was to have this education process about how to stop the bleed. And if you haven't participated in that yet, basically um, uh, Lily and, and uh, Yolanda and all of us have done this with the city. The idea is that um, that first little bit of time in Sandy Hook, they found that if they had had just something to stop the bleeding mm -hmm. with those children, if had mm -hmm. the bystanders or whoever who could do it, many of them might have been saved by that. So the idea is to learn how to stop the bleed, and they've actually changed the protocol to do it, and they had 88 people learn how to do the Stop the Bleed program there. And the Navy Hospital, they are just doing phenomenal in, in providing the instruction for this. It's a little awesome when you sit there with a little leg and you're mm -hmm. punching that stuff down in there, but, you know, you, you've done it. You know, and if it's your life or death thing, I'm going to, you know, do that as it was there. But um, it was a nice event and nice there. And then Harmony. Um, this is a program that um, Lily's unit um, has, and, uh, you know, this was, um, this is a program that was designed to create um, young people as um, future philanthropists, and the idea is they learn the power of philanthropy and how a little bit of money can inspire great things. And so this is about $3,000 they gave away. Uh, they raised parts of it, and um, support to this came from um, the Caring Communities Foundation, um, and uh, too, but um, the nice thing is these young people learned how to make decisions, what areas they wanted to target with grants from youth-led organizations, and then, as Willie knows, then they decided which groups to give to. And decision making is an important part of, you know, the power of philanthropy and doing things to that effect, as it was. That White Oak group, they have won almost every year. They have been very, very influential. They returned White Oaks to White Oak High School. That was their goal. And obviously from our tree perspective, that's a great deal. And then the fabric of the community. Um, another project that Lily was involved in with us um, here. This is from the Onzo Civic Affairs. Uh, it was the awards were given out at the Light Keepers kind of where they reward a lot of great groups um, for their volunteer effort. But specific to this, we saw some people who have had a significant impact on improving the quality of our life and they have contributed to our fabric of our community. Jackie Barton, many of you know, 
first African American to have a franchise for honey baked hams, and now she has the first ever honey baked hams franchise in an airport and aboard a military installation. Oh, she has just yeah. hit a trifecta there, as it was. Mm -hmm. Colonel John Kopka, all of us who know him know that he can, he can punch hard. <laughs> we'll put it that way. But he has done a lot for our community, and this is a wonderful thing. Otto Taylor. Um, with his wonderful project that he's done to empower young people to know that it wasn't just playing basketball, it was the power of looking at what you could be and how you could do it. And then, of course, Dr. Ken and Mrs. Mary Morgan um, for their donations to the community and their lifelong um, um, admiration that they've had of this community. When they first came here, they thought they were only going to stay a couple of years. And, um, you know, they are truly part of the fabric of this community. And Oliver Hill, who passed, um, but um, he was recognized posthumously um, with the fabric of the, um, he was accepted by, um, you know, Dr. Amy Ciceron and others there. So um, this is good. And it, this, this picture really does, with, uh, those were three women who knew him well, you know. And this is what the fabric looks like when we put all the panels together and, oh, and assemble that and um, make this happen as it is there. And so if you've got someone, um, tell Lily or I or any member of the Civic Affairs Committee and they nominate for last year. Where does that get displayed? Uh, at the, this meeting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we hope to do something, uh, you know, in the future as it is there. But it's, you know, it's a nice panel. It's a nice way of seeing that as it is. Too, okay. so yeah, it is pretty neat. Um, and then the Mayor's Youth Leadership Summit has happened since your last meeting. And uh, Lily, well, I'm going to let you take this one for a few words on that. Then. Um, this Mayor's Youth Leadership Summit is actually the second year. And it was um, created, they used to go to one in Charlotte. And decided that they wanted to do one here in Jacksonville that had never been done before. They plan it, they organize it, they pick their speakers, they promote it, they go back to their schools and encourage the uh, youth to come out. And as you can see, we had about 60 or so kids on a Saturday morning, half a day. Um, a cold Saturday. A cold morning. Saturday morning. They turned out and heard some great speakers. Then they had the afternoon, they had fun, they had a little dance and some <laughs> activities that they were able to participate in. So this is LaToya um, Scott with um, the uh, modeling, FTM. FTM modeling and talked to them about, about self-esteem and bullying. Uh, we had uh, Don Rochelle from the Partnership for Children talk about suicide prevention. Uh, Deontay Williams, who you may know, um, has a nonprofit organization. He talked about his uh, how his football career was cut off, but how he overcame that adversity and has gone on to do great things in the community and encourage them that they can do the, the same as well as Deontay there speaking to the group. So it was a very good Saturday morning. We're very proud of it and look forward to next year. Take this one too. <laughs> National Award, <laughs> now, Special Award, if you, One City, Our City, My City campaign. Uh, this year we submitted an application to the National League of Cities for their City Cultural Diversity Award and our One City our City, My City campaign won second place in the population of cities 50,001 to 200,000. And this is a national competition. So we were competing with other cities across the country. And Councilmember Angelia Washington, um, Councilmember Brian Jackson, and Mayor Pro Tem Lazar went to uh, D.C. And the presentation was uh, presented during their breakfast uh, award ceremony. And we are so excited. They came back, and I believe it was... Three weeks ago, last city council meeting, <laughs> meeting, it was represented to the citizens and to um, and uh, we acknowledged our mayor's faith group members, the committee of pastors that helped champion this cause, and so we're very proud. It's the first time that I know of. Was this any other time the city received such an award? So we're um, real excited. A lot of great work. We have other towns and cities call and ask how they can incorporate. Of my city, our city campaign in their own oh, area. Wow. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very beautiful. Yes. So glad to be a part of Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're part of the fabric of the community yes. too here, really. But the last thing I wanted to mention, obviously, um, we have on the other side of this wall and across some things there is Alan Covey. And he was here when we started G10, and um, we're now celebrating 12 years. Wow. Of, um, of G10, so think about that also as it was too, that what's gone on with that. And so we support you on that. And if you like, I'm just gonna roll right into the recycling moment real fast. And um, you know, um, this week um, after we know, remember we've talked about recycling before, okay. but this week um, sanitation actually started the process. They will not pick up containers that have 
the bad stuff in it. <laughs> we just put that. So this is it. So you might get a neighbor that gets upset. They're going to be a tag on it or something. So let's just all go through these little magic seven things that you can that you can put in there. Obviously, plastics one through seven and and one through six, one through five and seven. Excuse me, no six. I'm trying very hard to say no six in every way. So you can do all those in there. They're all good. That's all good for you there. Cardboard containers, empty and clean. The idea of this is we have to have a, we want to keep that recycling stream clean. Remember, China no longer takes this stuff. We, there's not markets for the dirty stuff anymore. And we have to pay extra for what, what goes in that can that doesn't mm. come out right. So aluminum and metal cans, all good. Empty and clean, though, please. Cardboard boxes, you need to flatten those up and do that type of stuff as it was. Glass of all colors. No more of this green, red. You know, remember, we went through all that, and many people remember that. That got confusing. Mixed paper. You cannot put shredded paper in there. Mm -hmm. um, as we mentioned, we want to get you out there to the site and let you see that site. Yeah. And, you know, this might be a great thing to do that's ju joint with your yes, other committee. You know? the same thing. Yes, but um, uh, it is... It's quite a sight. Have you all been out there to that? Well, you need to go with us. <laughs> to the Mer. It is incredible. They've got a computerized thing that uses air puffs as it comes through, and it recognizes a plastic piece of plastic, puts it over here. If it's paper, it puts it over there type stuff. But um, there's people standing there sorting this stuff all the time, as it was. Newspapers and magazines, easy stuff. That also includes junk mail, um, yeah, even unopened junk mail. But um, the exception... The, Richard loves to talk about pizza boxes, can't put pizza boxes in there, but the cardboard items, things like that that's contaminated with food, no. Now, we have documents for you. Um, if you're, um, hopefully that um, your, um, your, your rollout, residential rollout container has, um, has this sticker on it. Um, if not, I got you one here that you can put it on for yourself, you know, as if you'd like to do that. But that's, this tells you what's good and what's bad mm -hmm. there. Um, the red is bad. Green is good. So that's the little moment there as it is. This is the tag that you were getting, um, telling you that, um, gee, you had some stuff in there that wasn't good, um, you know, and they'd mark it for you. And then um, the other part was is that now we're given the notice tags. And that's saying, didn't pick up your stuff today, you know, so go from there as it was. So that's it from us. The only thing that people have asked me about this and I don't have an answer for is they want to know if it's not bagged and in their recycle container when the staff goes to dump it in the truck and it goes flying all over the neighborhood who's going to pick it up I'm like, I don't know the answer to that You're well we hope you do but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they make every effort not to let that happen obviously you don't they can't put stuff that's like yard waste into plastic bags mm -hmm because you can't recycle the plastic at the place where the yard waste right. goes. That's why that's like that. That's why paper bags and stuff decompose. That's all okay. You know. Well, that's but, why I told them, I said, you can take the paper grocery bags, yes, right? And yes. they could put it in yes. there and then put mm -hmm. it absolutely, in there. Absolutely, absolutely. But they thing. should, if they don't have one of the 32-gallon um, uh -huh. um, containers, just call 938-5338, mm -hmm. and they'll get you it to you. Mm -hmm. you know, we're here to serve you. I mean, you know. This is this is good, you know. We've, and there's good people out there that they're very um, they 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 really want to make sure the stream is cleaned up. And you do too, because this costs you as taxpayers. Um, many people look at the bill and they think that that little bit of money that's on your utility bill pays for the sanitation bill. It does not. Your tax dollars subsidize the sanitation collection, um, and so consequently, it's all in all of our best interest to try to clean that stream up and go. You saw where um, Swansboro and Holly Ridge are going to, uh, Rich, excuse me, Richlands is going to start charging uh, additional funds uh, for their processes. Um, you know, they told Jacksonville it'd be about $3,000 a month extra uh, for the trash that's in the recycling stream. Um, so this, this can add up quickly. And that's just, that's not good stuff. So we all have an interest in getting that right. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else from you? Not from us. We're okay. going to be quiet. Unless the, no, Lily no, has something no, she no. wants to talk about. No. Okay. <laughs> um, as for the planning advisory board, um, really the last couple of meetings have just kind of been cleaning up some verbiage mm -hmm. with 
zoning um, and a big focus is the amount of signage that is being put on buildings. It's, they're only allowed a certain amount. However, several businesses are exceeding that. So they're just trying to figure out a way to tackle that. So that's kind of some conversation that's been going on. As for new stuff, I don't think there's anything that we hadn't talked about before. Again, there's the Gateway Marketplace, which is going to be um, on Western Extension and Publix is going to be part of that. And then there's also a retail center um, also on Western Boulevard. It's going to be just about 8,500 square feet with six units. So um, that's really the main stuff. So I'm sure there will be more to come the next time we meet. I'll have more information for y'all. But to show how that slowed, you know, your plan, your meeting for next week has been canceled. Right. You know, yeah. So we won't even have a meeting for yeah. next week. It's slowed, but we're still yes. getting commercial. There's mm -hmm. still commercial yep, out there, there but, you know, not all of it has to be reviewed either. Right. Um, okay. Other than that, do anybody else have any comments, questions, concerns? Next, um, <laughs> our, next, report, right? <laughs> our next meeting is going to be Thursday, June 7th at 6, and our topic is going to be code enforcement and community development as needed. Planning and election and of officers. And planning and also election of officers. So think about which um, position you want to fill as an officer. Because <laughs> Suzanne does have to step down this time. Two years. It's been her two years, so you know. I think it's on year six. <laughs> you had broken service, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you did two, then Grace did two, and now you've done two again. Yes. So you know, <laughs> so we need to look around and um, you know choose someone wisely. So we'll go from there. All right. Um, this time, do we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank Say hi to Miss Betty that's sick at home watching us. <laughs> you did well.